Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, that it is. I see. Getting all wet over my record number six of four plane. Not four plane. Four plane. Yeah, well, you see. I'm at it, donkeys, yes, me. This record number six, four plane. Now I hear you say, you'd like one. Hmm? One of these number six, four planes, such as this record, or a Stanley Bailey, maybe. Like my number seven, Stanley Bailey, up here. But you can't find one, no. Now get a little rear in good condition. You might have to do a bit, had to put a renovation on one if you can find one. Now my suggestion to you is to see, find one from the 60s to the well, 1980s, you know, sort of best sort of value for a usable hand plane. You've got to ask yourself, are you buy, buying a collector's item to put on the shelf to look pretty? Or are you buying a hand plane to do a job? Mm-hmm. The plane would. Well, well, I would say 1960s to 1980s will suit you. But let's say for you still can't find one and you can't afford a Lee Nielsen, a Veritas, a Wood River or a Clifton. No, because I can't either. No, at 500 odd quid for a hand plane, I can't warrant that. No. So what would I do? If I didn't already have my collection, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd get hold of one of them Chinese import jobbies, such as this one. Yeah, I know it's rusty, okay? <laughs> this used to be my father's. One of the last things he bought. And he passed away. So I ended up having it. And I'll give it to my son. <laughs> Which he's gonna get back after I've sorted it out, after he's allowed it to get into this state. Yeah, I basically lent it to him. And <laughs> fortunately, uh, yeah, I, I usually say never be a lender, neither a lender nor a borrower be. You shouldn't lend it to also, you just shouldn't. But anyway, I can't semi give it to him, if that makes sense. And fortunately, he just left it in the barn, and as you can see, it's rusted. rusted. He, he, he was on the stream, he said, Dad, I, don't, I just don't know how to use it. Fair enough, okay. I'll, I'll show you, I said. But first of all, let me sort this flipping thing out. So that's what we're going to do in a future video. But for now, what we'll do is we're going to strip it down and have a look, see what the difference is between that one and that one. Yeah, the record. And this Axminster jobby. Now, first of all, I've already done a video about the weight difference. The number six record weighs three kilos, pretty much dead on. All right? It's a nice weight. It is. And it feels, it feels good in the hand. It feels manageable. It's nicely balanced. It's a good tool. And yes, I have pimped this one up myself anyway. Well, you know, it's got a new um, knob on there and it's got a new tote on, on there. That is. It fits my hand. Up. Someone has commented about that. Actually, does that make a difference? For me, it does. Because my hand always falls in exactly the same place every time I pick up the tool. Now, and also the thing I've done, it's also, I've upgraded the plain irons to the Victor hand forged. Plain irons with a Clifton chip breaker. Make a massive difference. I mean, a really big difference. And they're three mil um, thick plain irons, like the old, like the old ones. I mean, like from the old wooden pl uh, hand planes. And uh, unlike the, the two mil thick, sort of more common two millimeter thick uh, plain irons, you know, the blade. Now, first impressions between the two is that this is clunky. I mean, it is literally clunky. It's like a Skoda. <laughs> I'm talking the old Skoda or like a Lada or something like that. Or a Wart Wartburg. Is it Wartburg? You know, anyway, really clunky and it's just not refined. Now, when I pick this up, it just feels, it, it needs some work. It really needs some work. But when my dad bought this new, it was like 40 pounds from, this was about five, year, five six years ago, um, from Axminster in the UK. And basically it's a Chinese import. It looks similar to me to like one of the um, faithful uh, hand planes and they do a whole range of them. The Faithful actually do quite a, quite a good range of hand planes actually. You, you also the shapes and sizes and they're okay tools providing you do a little bit of work on them. You need a little bit of work on, on the plane iron as you would have to do with any plane when you first get it but also on the sole. Anyway let's take this thing apart shall we? I think so. That's what I'm going to do. Have I got a screwdriver? I've got a screwdriver that will do. All right. Should we start with the obvious things? Let's do the easy things first shall we? Um, you know, it's a big difference here between the two here. Here you've got the uh, Bailey, the Bailey designed or painted um, lever cap. Um, I think it was like 1860 or something he painted that, but anyway. And then you've got this screw type, it's quite common as well, um, lever cap. So let's have a look difference between those two. The weight is very similar, very similar. The finish of that is just, there's no comparison. <laughs> this, is, this is clearly just a cheap casting with a bit of chrome and plating on it, you know, but it's... It is what it is, isn't it? You know, there's a cost difference. You know, if you get one of these second hand now, it's still going to cost you a few hundred quid. You know, so um, that. 
I'd give it away. <laughs> Seriously. Um, all right, let's have a look at this chip breaker because the thing about a chip breaker, it needs to be flat to the plain iron. This, oh my God, that screw's too short. <laughs> I've still got it. It's in the drawer somewhere with all the screwdrivers. Yes, the retaining screw. I did that half a turn and it fell out. Oh my God, that's way too short. And now I've got to find, find it. Crikey. Found it. <laughs> oh dear. All right, that, that just feels very, very short or loose. Oh, then too short. No, no, it is too short actually. It might be just me. It might have been just me. No, that's not too short, so that was just me. I undone. I took too much out. It was very, very loose though. Currently, it doesn't meet properly, so that would need flattening for a start. So watch that. I know this one's a crikey, that is loose. You have to, yeah. Blimey. First, first of all, the screw, the retaining screw, is sloppy. Let's have a look at that in comparison to the record. Oh, God, sharp. <laughs> I just cut myself. <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, keep tools nice and sharp. Yeah. A blunt tool's a dangerous tool, my father used to say. <laughs> oh, chalk and cheese. Well, okay, this is a Clifton. All right, this is a Clifton chip break. I'm pretty sure it's Clifton. I think that's what I bought was Clifton a long while ago, man. But um, I have actually cut myself on the corner of the pan plate, um, corner of the plane arm. If you listen to this, can you hear that? That's, that's a good way, don't I? Yeah, can you hear that? It's loose. It's a lot of wobble. A bit like me on the actual retaining screw for the plane iron. And on this one, zero. There's zero movement in that, in that screw. Yeah, zero movement on the Clifton, you know. Okay, I'm going to say, what about a Stanley Bailey then? I think a, a Clifton chip breaker, you know, Assembly is a little bit of an unfair comparison, really, isn't it? So I've got this um, Stanley Bailey here. Is that sloppy? This is an old Stanley Bailey. I can't remember what type it is. It's post-war. Like I say, post-war, about 1960s, 1970s is, is a good era. I'm pretty certain that's post-war. I do have a, um, a wartime uh, blame, which is uh, one I'm restoring over there. So um, place it over there. Zero. Now, pretty much no movement at all. A little bit, hardly anything in the actual Stanley Bailey. So, it's not because it's, yeah, this one's a Clifton um, chip breaker, no. So that's not really an excuse, is it really? I would say that's quite poor on the uh, on this Chinese Axminster, remember? It cost about 40 quid, I remember Dad bragging about it, it cost 40 quid, I thought I'd give it a go. Fair enough. My, my father, he was a hell of a craftsman. I mean, crikey, he was more of a woodworker than I am. He was an amazing guy, but, he, was all, he always bought cheap, really cheap tools, really cheap tools. But still, the stuff he used to produce. To me, it just proves that you don't have to spend a fortune. Right, so that's my little Stanley Bailey number four. I'll put that back over here. All right, so that's my first impression of that one. There's obviously no comparison between the uh, Clifton and this. Um, I'll put the right way right around. There's the right around on there. Right, so, this thing is lovely. I generally place the chip breaker about between a mil and three mil back from the from the plane edge. There's a bit of controversy about that, and it really depends on what you're planing. If you're planing softwoods, a lot of resin in that, you want to keep the plan the chip breaker a bit further back. Okay, this is my you know a little tip for you, a little bit further back, keep it about nearer three millimeters. Other than that, I would say around a millimeter from the edge of the plane arms. You're playing like oak and stuff like that. The reason for that is you want to clear. The, um, resinous woods as quick as possible otherwise it'll build up and build up um, in the mouth of the plane and it'll potentially go between the chip breaker and the actual um, plane iron itself which can be a problem you have to be forever clearing out your chip breaker and your plane iron so I just set it accordingly to the tin I'm working with you know, I know a lot of people don't bother doing that a lot of people even talk about doing that but that's fair enough you know if that's, if, if that's your thing we all have our ways don't we you know so let's move this one over heads a little bit because I'm more interested in this Axminster at the moment, so far, so well, it is mediocre, let's be honest. And yes, it, uh, yeah, and before, if you, if you just click into the video, yes, it needs a lot of TLC. <laughs> I mean, look at the state of it. I haven't cleaned it, this is literally how he dropped it off to me yesterday. I thought, oh God, really? So everything's probably going to be corroded, isn't it? Oh, that's come on, Dad. Right, I do have, I'll tell you what I'll do, before I carry on, so I don't damage anything else, let's give that a little bit of. <laughs> Let's give it a little bit of a square in there. I don't know if you just saw that, but yeah. All right, that's soaking there a little bit. Um, let's undo that screw. 
Now generally these normally a captive screw, which this one is as well. Okay, that is captive. I need to put a pair of pliers on there and take that captive screw off the off the actual threaded bolt. Now this is something that is quite nice about this one. It's actually chromium. Now because that's chromium, unlike a lot of the Stanleys, well, this, is a, this is a record, but like Stanleys, they usually eat just steel and they rust inside the knob. So it's a good idea occasionally to remove your knob. Okay, your knob, all right, and lube your tool. Hence this threaded arrangement here and what have you, and then put it back on again, literally. Now, the other thing you might notice, especially on wooden handled hand planes, you might have a situation where the actual hand, the, the tote, not the knob so much, but the tote go, gets loose. And the reason for that is this threaded rod that generally goes right through the tote and into the uh, sole of the plane is, it, you, you can tie it up, but you get to a point where you can't tie it anymore. Because what happens is, because the grain is going that way on this tote, it shrinks that way, so it becomes too low, and then enough room for your actual screw to tighten up, so you can't, you can't get rid of that wobble. Now you have a few choices about that, one is to make a new, uh, make new tote, quite often that's a preferable thing to do anyway. The other thing you can do, all right, is just remove the screw, which we'll do in a moment, we'll do it now if you like, hopefully that will come undone. Oh, a bit tighter. Squeaky. So remove that screw, and there's a screw down on the, into the sole as well. Let's just see there, one there. So we're now going to remove that. Luckily, everything's coming undone quite easily. It's not that old, the template. Literally, it's about five, six years old. That's all it is. <laughs> it's been looked after, isn't it? Oh, God's sake. Now, when you give something to somebody, you do kind of expect them to look after it, don't you? And not necessarily just dump it in the barn and forgot about it. It's been used. We've done some... Had some uh, it's a wood in the plane, but plane iron between the plane iron and the ship breakers. It's been used, but very, very badly. That's something he doesn't know how to. So he needs, you know, a bit of education. When well, you can find time, that is, because he's busy. Oh, by the way, I just had another grandchild. Yeah, last night, another baby was born. I've got 11 now. <laughs> God's sake. All right, that's what I'm talking about. This, ah, so you see here, even though it's, um, ah, that one. See, this is the thing about it. There's no consistency on the knob. It's chromium plate, right? Which is good because it doesn't rust so quite so quickly. On the back here, this one, this threaded rod here, isn't. It's got all oxidisation all over it. Is it chromium? No, it's not chromium at all, I think. So, uh, I don't know. Is it plate? There might be plate. It's oxidised, whatever it is. It hasn't rusted. So, so the thing is, what I was saying earlier. If you're finding that you can't actually um, tighten this up, you have a few options. One is you can put some washers underneath the actual um, screw, which is one way of doing it. The only problem is the screw then poking out a bit further. You might have room, you might not. The other thing is to shorten the bolt, yeah? So you can either add a bit of wood to the bottom of, of the handle or you can shorten the bolt. You just grind the top off a little bit and then a little bit. You need about probably sixteenth of an inch, two or three mil. You know, sixteenth to eighteenth, six, sixteenth to an eighth of an inch, probably what plenty, because there should be enough meat on there. And then you can put it back on again and tie it up, and it shouldn't shouldn't move. So, crikey! Now the casting here. Look at this casting comparison to this record. It has reinforcing ribs. That's probably where the extra weight comes in, because you say six hundred grams heavier. So we have this raised area here, which you do have on the record, um, but then there's this uh, reinforcing rib here. This crossbar is heavier and taller. Also, I'm looking at the actual base. This area here on the where the hand or the tote uh, fixes to is actually slightly longer and taller. And also the sides are taller and less refined, to say the least. There's a nice taper on these, these sides from the base of the actual sole to this edge. It's still five, on average, five millimetres thick, but it tapers from there, you know, from, from there, from the inside to the top. So the base to the top, it tapers. It's just, it's just a nicer, a nicer thing. It really is. And the other thing I just noticed, we're, we're, there's no maker's name or anything uh, cast into the sole. Nothing whatsoever, no, no writing, no, nothing. Is there any numbers? See if there's anything underneath the frog. I'm just going to remove the frog. And we'll have a look, see if there's anything under the frog. So I will be cleaning this plane all up and making it all, well, try and make it usable. Because currently it is not. Right, so the frog arrangement is very, very similar uh, to the Stanley 
Bailey. I would say also to the uh, record. The difference here is though, on the record, on the adjustment for the frogs, so you've got a screw in here, okay, which adjusts the frog to and forth, to and fro. So um, here where it's, there's this little recess in there is where this adjustment screw sort of sits into. On the record and also on the, um, the Stanley Baileys, you have a little piece of, like a metal yoke in there, just at the bottom there, at the bottom of the actual um, frog, and that sits into that adjusting screw. So you're gonna adjust the frog to and forth. forth. So you can basically make sure the plane iron isn't, uh, isn't exactly the right place in the throat. Now, if you are looking for older hand planes, you might find that you can't remove this frog. This is another Stanley Bailey design. Um, sorry, Leonard Bailey design. He's when he's, he basically started all the paintings, and then Stanley Bailey, as a tyrant as he is, or was, uh, we're talking about uh, Frederick Stanley. He was a uh, he's a bit of an ass actually. But anyway, <laughs> although I have to admit, if it wasn't for people like him, we might not have things like these, you know, just print design. So, I mean, like you know, like the records or the uh, the uh, Stanley Bailey's. So the thing about this frog, it has to be in line with the mouth, so the actual plain iron doesn't engage with the. Doesn't, isn't resting, so there's a gap behind the where the blade rests on the edge of the mouth, so the edge of this area here, and the actual frog itself. So you know, like a no man's land, it's also trying to spring on there, and what you're trying to get chatter. So when you're trying to play something, you get a knot or something, yeah, it's not great. They're like rumble strips. <laughs> um, the thing about this plane is, I suppose, for the money, 40 odd quid, you have got everything that everything's there, you know. You, it's all there. It kind of it works to a degree. It needs some refining. Now on the sole itself, I noticed it wasn't flat. No, the casting was a bit shoddy. Um, and if I get a one way turn, is if you grab a, well, either a combination square or something like that, or just you run a rule down your hand plane. Now do this if you find an old hand plane. Do this anyway, because if it's had a lot of wear. The likelihood is going to be down the centre of the sole. It'll be down this area here. And if there's anywhere, that's where you, you, the sole of your hand plane is going to be out. You're going to need to flatten it, ideally. You have to ask yourself how important that is. It really depends on the type of work that you're doing. If you just try, uh, you put a leading edge on a door, does it really matter? No. No, it's a bit pedantic, isn't it? But I noticed that when I was shining light through that I could see light through it. It's not around, it's mainly around the mouth area, which is quite common. And I also noticed there was a bit of a fall in the actual, very slight, in, in basically it's bent, like that, a like, bit like banana, but fractionally, hardly anything. So that wasn't, you know, but, uh, what I'll do is, you see, I, I don't want to spend any money on it, all right? So I'll probably get uh, the linen shell, which is basically a big belt sander, and I'll plonk it on top of there, flatten it that way, because I have had that machine, so that is pretty done flat, and it does a good job. The other thing you could do, you see, is if you've got, is have a flat board, a piece of, Oh, it's an argument sake, a piece of MDF, and get a piece of uh, sandpaper, emery paper preferably, glue it down on there, and literally just keep it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. You ain't gonna make it worse, put it like that. Don't try and attack it with an angle grinder. I've seen people try to do that with a flat sanding disc in it. They make a mess of it, you know, but twist it. Also, it's a terrible idea, don't do it. All you need to just some flat, and then you just run the actual body of the plane over the sandpaper, Providing it's on something flat. Now, if you've got a cast iron tabletop, the likelihood is that is flat. And what you can do is you can grab some um, decorator's tape, whack a little decorator's tape to the width of your sandpaper onto your table saw top, and then literally with a few dobs of super glue, stick down your um, sandpaper or your emery paper, uh, such as something like that, to the actual top of your cast iron. Um, so it's like to be flat, you see. Cast on top to your table saw, or even a uh, surface plane or a jointer or something like that. And then just run it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards until it is flat. It will work, it'll do the job. And then you decide whether or not you want to paint it up or have this one's in good condition, really, in, in that way. It's just really the corrosion. And none of the corrosion is particularly deep. No. That's the, probably the worst bit. Should we have a look? <laughs> There we go, there's a, bit, there's a little bit of paper there, ripped it off. Now you can use a bit of wet and dry paper if you like, with a bit of double D40, that, that works well as well. But it doesn't flatten. All it'll do is just take off the actual um, the rust. So considering this has been laying in a barn, a damp barn, 
yes, with a mud floor. I don't think that is actually too bad. No, it's going to clean up quite nicely, I think. So a bit of TLC on there will make that into a usable tool. And I thought I'd just share with you because this, um, we all get us kind of had to put a bit sick fantastical about our Stanley Bailey's and, you know, other, and some of these lovely pan plans you can get these days. And they cost an absolute fortune and not everybody can afford it, can they? So the point being is that you might find a tool on a car boot or maybe in the old granny's attic. Uh, not in Nickers, her attic. An uh, old tool like that. <laughs> right. You might also find an old tool in old granny's knickers. I don't know <laughs> what goes on in your house. No. But my point being is, is that you can actually make a good tool at one of these old Chinese things or maybe uh, a Stanley Bailey or something like that that obviously would need some TLC. And a bit of wire brushwork and a bit of sanding here and there. Maybe a little bit of machining. As long as you've got all the bits there, everything's you know intact. You shouldn't have too much problems. But even with the, sta the Stanleys or the records, you can get all the bits for them. But you might not want to spend the money. You know? So find an intact tool. Even if there's a little bit of corrosion on it, it will clean up. You know, provided it's not too pitted. Something else to notice about this is the actual the screw for the for the actual um tote. <laughs> isn't in the middle. I just know it's that the tote is at an angle. <laughs> you know. That's not very clever, is it? That is silly. Let's see if I can maneuver that into a bit of position. No, it's just in the wrong place. So, you know, you have to put up with some of these little quirks, don't you? You know, and uh, do what you can do to make it any usable tool. It's just how pedantic do you need to be about it? Thing is, if it works, that ain't wrong, is it? That's what I say. Anyway, so, you know, don't rule out the old Chinese. Uh, tools, I wouldn't anyway, um, especially if you haven't got a lot of money. No, otherwise, you know, I suppose, I suppose the point is, it's better to have a tool that you that you can use and it'll do the job and have no tool at all. It's better to be a tool than not a tool and never get the lube, your tool. Toodle-doo.